Our call to worship today is from the book of Psalms, Psalm 139, verses 1 through 6. O Lord, thou hast searched me and known me. Thou knowest when I sit down and when I rise up. Thou discernest my thoughts from afar. Thou searchest out my path and my lying down, and art acquainted with all my ways. Even before a word is on my tongue, lo, O Lord, thou knowest it all together. Thou dost beset me behind and before, and layest thy hand upon me. Such knowledge is too wonderful for me, it is high, I cannot attain it. Let's remain standing for our processional hymn. This morning, I'd like to ask Luke to come on up with me. Luke, this is a very special day for you and our church. It's a special day for our church family, too. You have been loved on and liked and coveted <laughs> as a member here for a long time, and your family is very special to us. Because of that, I wanted something special to honor this day for you. Debbie McDaniel wrote these words and quoted some wonderful scripture, and I want to share this with everyone this morning. For I know the plans I have for you, declares the Lord, plans to prosper you and not to harm you, 
plans to give you hope and a future. Jeremiah 29, 11. The season of graduation, Luke, and new beginnings can bring a mixed bag of emotions to many of us. Though it's a time of celebration and fresh starts, the letting go process, especially from moms and dads, can bring some pain too. Yet parenting is often just about that, the letting go. And whether it's letting go as they head to kindergarten or letting go as they head to college or straight off to your first job, it can be difficult. But there's hope to remember. Our children are his. No matter where they go or how old they are, they are in his care. They are in his hands. And he has a great purpose for them in this life. And that's the very best place we can let them go. We're entrusting them again and straight into the safe care of a powerful and loving God. And that's the safest place they can be. His hands are big to carry, to hold, to protect, to cover, to lead. And he loves each one of them more than we can ever imagine. So here's to a great year ahead for you, Luke, and God's blessings upon you. Would you pray with me, please? Dear God, thank you for Luke. We pray for him today and lift him before you. We thank you so much for his love for you and for the work you are continuing to do in his life. He is a gift to us and many others. And during this season of new beginnings, we ask that you would make his way clear. We ask that you would keep his footsteps firm and remind him that you are with him always. May he sense the freshness of your spirit over his life in amazing ways. And may he be strengthened, instilled with hope for the new words you have in store and the new roads you have in store. And today again, we release Luke straight into your tender care because we know that's the best place he could ever be. We thank you in advance for all you have in store for this day, for this year, and for his life. Father, we pray for protection, for your covering, that you would surround Luke and his life with a shield, protect his coming and going. We ask that you would help him to live aware in a dark world and keep harm or evil intent far away. We ask that you would hide him in the safety of your powerful presence. We ask for your wisdom and clear direction over Luke's life, that you would give him understanding beyond his years. Thank you that your timing is perfect. We pray that you would direct his steps, your plans for him will prosper, and that every place you have determined for him to walk will be paved clear. We ask for you to open doors that need to be opened and close every one that be, should be shut tight. Allow every gift and treasure you have placed inside his life to grow, develop, and flourish to bring you glory. We ask that you would remind Luke every day how much you love him, that he would find security and confidence fully in you, knowing that you are trustworthy and true. We ask too, Father, that you would teach Luke your ways and fill him with an unquenchable desire to learn your word. Give him a compassionate spirit and the wisdom to look beyond outward appearances to the heart within. We pray that you will surround Luke with friends and leaders who would challenge him to press closer to you. We ask also for your peace to cover him. We ask for laughter and joy to fill his days. We pray that you would give Luke boldness and courage to face challenges set before him with the confidence and peace that only can come from your spirit. We ask that you would raise up greatness in Luke's life, greatness too in his generation, willing to stand strong and firm, passionate for you, believing that you have designed him for purpose and good works which you have planned and prepared in advance for him to do. Be a light for Luke, for his feet, and a lamp to his path. Shine over him, Father. Fill him with your spirit. Bless him with your favor and peace. In Jesus' name, amen. You may be seated. <coughs> Deuteronomy. 6 calls us to love the Lord our God with all our heart, our mind, and our soul. But it also, more importantly, calls us 
as believers to pass our faith and our love in God on to the younger generations. And it calls us to do this in our everyday lives, in the things that mark when we wake up, when we walk, when we eat, but also when we celebrate milestones. And today is definitely one of the most important milestones in the life of Luke. It is our celebration of his high school graduation. Um, and as part of that, we want to present Luke uh, with a Bible. Uh, this Bible is Red Letter Edition in IV, and it has been uh, embossed with his name on it. So Luke, that's the first thing. I want to give you that. All right. We also want to congratulate you and tell you that we love you and that we want to continue to be your family of families. Um, and we want to continue to support you as you move on. Many of you may or may not know, as he is graduating from Watauga High School, Luke plans to attend a welding school um, in the far reaches of our state, Murphy, I believe, um, where he is going to further his education um, and move towards becoming a professional welder. Um, so and at this time, Luke, I want to give you the opportunity to say a few things to your family. First, I'd like to thank my entire church family for the reception held this morning in my honor. I've been here at First Baptist for as long as I can remember. Many of you have known me since, I was, since before I was three. Thanks to being a part of RAs, I was able to go to Camp Caraway, where I accepted Jesus into my heart. From mission friends, RAs, handbells, choir, and then youth, this has always been my home for me. And I especially thank each one who has shown me support over the years. I really appreciate all the love. Thank you.
Let us pray, please. Our Heavenly Father, as we come into this house that you have so graciously helped us give to the, on this corner, we ask that you bless these gifts today and all the givers. We thank you for the sunshine that we finally have seen today and ask that we continue to have that for days to come. Bless Luke as he goes on to his next adventure in life and all the folks that are here today. Bless them too. Amen. invite you to bring public prayers to the sanctuary as we gather on holy ground to worship God right where he meets us. And so let's lift names to God. You're invited to audibly share what's on your heart and soul as we pray for one another. And following that time of prayer together, I will close our prayers. Let us pray. O oh Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayers as we pray for one another and we gather to worship you and to, to focus our eyes on you and our ears, giving attention to your word. So, holy God, we thank you for this day of celebrations, this day of honesty, this day of arrival to, to gather in your house to worship you, God, alone. So, God, accept our worship and our prayers and our music and the words read and shared. Speak to us, God, how you choose to speak. Oh, may your children be listening. We pray for one another, and many have been named, and we do pray for those that are hurting, the sick that are in our midst and in our homes. And we lift them to you, God, and we seek healing, your, your great physician hand placed on them. And we pray for your perfect will. And God, our prayers uh, in dependence on you as we pray for healing that we can see and touch. But God, may we be assured this day of perfect healing. 
of perfect forever in your presence and in your place, in your home. It's been built not by earthly hands, but hands that can't be seen, that are built a heavenly home that we're making our way towards. Oh, holy God, be with all that are hurting and sick. And we ask for your healing and grant that as we pray for our neighbors and our, our home, our country, our world. We pray for healing. We pray for family. We pray for restoration, transformation, new beginnings, grace that results from true forgiveness. Oh, God, thank you for loving us and meeting us and caring for us. And on this day, as we gathered to worship and began with words of a psalmist, thank you for knowing us and for searching us, knowing our foundation before we were even formed. Oh, God, thank you for your love, that detailed, that real, that unconditional, that present. And God, we pray for mission partners all over the world, many we name as CBF or North Carolina Baptist on Mission or Disaster Relief or our new song in Nicaragua. And we lift our missionaries to you, God. We ask you to bless them, and grant them peace and strength and confidence to share the good news of Jesus with the world that so needs to hear your love for them, your promise for them, your presence with them, and your provisions. Oh, God, use us as a voice, as a hand, as feet in sharing that good news. And finally, God, we pray that this hour pleases you. Grant us your spirit, and your presence. And we ask all of this in the precious and holy name of Jesus. Amen. And amen. And amen. Our New Testament lesson is an epistle lesson this morning. It's found from Paul's letter to the church at Corinth, 2 Corinthians, 2 Corinthians chapter 4, beginning with verse 5. 2 Corinthians chapter 4, beginning with verse 5. Hear these words. For we do not proclaim ourselves. We proclaim Jesus Christ as Lord and ourselves as your slaves for Jesus' sake. For it is the God who said, Let light shine out of darkness, which has shone in our hearts to give the light of the knowledge of the glory of God in the face of Jesus Christ. But we have this treasure in clay jars so that it may be made clear that this extraordinary power belongs to God and does not come from us. We are afflicted in every way, but not crushed, perplexed, but not driven to despair, persecuted, but not forsaken, struck down, but not destroyed, always carrying in the body the death of Jesus so that the life of Jesus may also be made visible in our bodies. For while we live, we are always being given up to death for Jesus' sake, so that the life of Jesus may be made visible in our mortal flesh. So death, yes, in it work in us, but life in you. Amen. <laughs>
Great job. Thank you. I heard, I think you probably all heard it too, Jimmy praying and saying, thank you, God, for that sunshine we finally got to see. That was a great prayer following that wonderful hymn of congregational singing of there is sunshine in my heart and then hearing the, the choir sing their anthem of lifting our voice. It's, it's an Easter, so to speak, that sun that comes following the rains. Of course, I watched a little four-year-old yesterday uh, in her, on her, at her birthday party playing in the rain. I mean, it, it, it looked like sunshine to me. She was playing in the rain and dancing in the rain, and every friend that showed up, look who's here, granddaddy, and ran to greet that friend. And I mean, it was sunshine in the midst of the rain. This morning, Paul tells us not to lose heart, not to lose heart, that in the darkness, we are to shine the light. We are to shine the light. It comes from the darkness, and our calling is not to lose heart, but to shine, to shine, and to let our light shine in the darkness. Last week, we shared together words of the prophet Isaiah, words of Paul encouraging another church, the church at Rome. And Isaiah, in that incredible experience of, of his, when he said to God, here I am, send me, it was just after a storm, after rain in his life, that he said, here I am, send me. That it was in the darkness that he could experience light. It was in the darkness where he heard voices that come from the dark. For it's usually in the dark that we hear words from darkness. And Isaiah, at the death of a king, saw God that day. He saw God. So we can sing with the country singer, I saw God today. And Isaiah saw Paul encouraged that church at Rome to see God when he looked in the mirror. That may be the very hardest place to do that. We may be, we may be willing to look around and say, I can see God in so-and-so's life or those experiences or what they meant to me or how they touched me. But do we claim that adoption as our own when we read those scriptures from Romans 8, a, a, a chapter that, that we all stand on and live on? And so Romans 8, do we, do we claim that adoption? Do we claim we are truly children of God? So then when we look in the mirror, do we see God? Do we see God? If we do, that's the confidence that, that Paul's trying to remind Rome to go out into the world with that kind of confidence. <laughs> that, that when you look in the mirror, you see God. You've got something to share, to give. And it's not easy. It begins with honesty. <clears throat> it begins with honesty. It begins with, I need grace. It begins with, I, I need Jesus. It begins, help me, <clears throat> God. I, I, I'm not so sure, God. I, I don't like you today, God. I, I don't know, God. I have questions, God. It begins. That's where resurrection comes from, is that gut honesty. That gut honesty and looking in the mirror. Do you see God today? For us, for us as a community of faith, the celebration of individuals. Do we want to be seen? Is our greatest desire to be seen? And I, I'm reminded that the more we desire to be seen, the more we desire to be seen, the less we see. The more we desire to be seen, the less we see. Maybe that looking in the mirror is all about when nobody sees me. Nobody else notices me. What about me? Look at me. See me. Here I am. But the courage of Rome, the courage of Isaiah, the courage of the church of Corinth to say, send me, can only come when we can say, I see God when I see me. The more we seek to be seen, the less we see. And those are some of the words we're going to look at in the psalm that was read that called us to worship in the letter to the church at Corinth. It says, don't lose heart. For we lose heart when it's all about only what we can see and not the unseen. It's all about the temporary and not the forever. It's all about what we build with earthly hands and not heavenly hands. Paul says, don't lose heart. Y'all know I'm a Grand Ole Opry guy. 
I love country music, and I love the Grand Ole Opry. And last night, I was, I'd gotten home pretty late from a birthday party. You might hear more about that. Daryl, I may owe the treasury before the day's over lots of money, you know. Daryl, when he was on the finance committee, said I had to chip in a, a bunch of money every time I said the word Amelia. Got in late, and I was listening to the Grand Ole Opry, and Vince Gill was on that. Vince Gill talked about his relationship with Amy Grant. Vince Gill married Amy Grant, and he said how different their lives were. That when Amy Grant was growing up, when Amy Grant was growing up, she was in church every Sunday. Her, her life, her family, that, that, was, that was her life. She was in church every Sunday. And Vince said that his life, he never went to church. It, it, he just never went. I mean, it was just not, he didn't know it. He didn't know that experience. He didn't, he didn't know God. And he, he just said that wasn't who he was. It says in that relationship with Amy, he felt like they had the same heart. They grew closer together and they got married. And he wrote a new song. He said, and this is his newest song. And he sang it the very first time last night to Grand Ole Opry. And the words went something like that. And I'm not going to, you know, I'm not going to try to sing in that sweet, lonesome sound, high tenor voice of Vince Gill. I know better. But he sang this. He said, when Amy prayed. These were the words. When Amy prays, I see Jesus. When I hear Amy pray, I see Jesus. When I hear Amy pray, that's when I raise my hand. Do you see God today? Do you see God today? Do you focus and see and hear on the eternal or the temporary? Paul says, don't lose heart. Don't stop. Don't, don't lose heart. But it's not easy. But, but, but let me give you some confidence. Be bold. Be courageous. Don't lose heart. In Rome, it was you're a child of God. We'll hear words to Corinth in just a moment. And so the psalmist said, God, you search me, you know me. We're asked to, we're asked to, to put our eyes, our attention, our, our faith, our, our following, our, our, our quest to be and to figure it out in, in the God that made us. And, and, and a beginning place for the psalmist was, God, you search me, you know me, you made me, you even know the frame, my frame, what people don't see. That's the frame, right? I mean, we see buildings go up. We see the framework go up, but then we don't ever see it again. God knew the frame of you before you were ever seen by this earth. God knows who and how we were made. And also, God knows the hand you were dealt. God knows you. So we can get away from even the, the knitting and the, and the birthing and the, and the know me when I'm made and born, but God knows the hand we've been dealt. God knows the, 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 the tough, maybe it was the hardest thing to get up and be here today or to, to exist today. God knows that. And there's a difference in God and us. There's a difference in God and us. How many moves ahead? God knows us. God searches us. God knows foundation before us. God knows later before us. If if, if there's a difference, how many moves ahead does God think? How many moves ahead does God think? How many years ahead does God think about your life? How many moments ahead does God think? Think about the game of chess. The game of chess. I don't know if any of you are chess masters in here or play chess. But think about it. It's said that a beginner, a beginner in playing chess is doing really good really good when they think three moves ahead. I mean, they're, they're doing really good. I don't know about you, when I play chess, I say, well, I think I'll move the pawn here. And then, okay, now what do I do? You know, I mean, but, but a really good beginner thinks three moves ahead. A chess master, a chess master thinks 30 moves ahead. I mean, that's hard for me to fathom. 30 moves ahead. So, God is even more than a chess master. More like the chess master than the beginner. But 30 moves, that's, that's just a snap of a finger to the God that knows us, searches us, made us. 
So the psalmist confesses that he doesn't look ahead. He knows God does, but he doesn't. The psalmist says, I, I, don't. I don't. I don't look ahead. I confess, God, I'm, I'm about the moment. I'm about this day. I'm about what I'm feeling. I'm about right now. And, he, and he, in the middle, after saying, you search me, you know me, you made me, you love me, he begins to say, you know, I want judgment on all those who are not in love with you like I am. <laughs> if you read Psalm 39, he quickly goes from search me, know me, you're great God, to, you know, I wish you'd slap some judgment on all the people that don't love you like I do. I wish you'd zap them quick, God. They don't love you like I do. He says, remember, God, I count them as enemies, just like I, I count them as enemies, God. I'm keeping score for you, God. Zap them. In Psalm 139, writer confesses, I don't look ahead. But then he gets there. In verse 23 and 24 in Psalm 139 that led us into worship in the 23rd and 24th verse, the psalmist refers back to that beginning of that writing and says, Search me, O God, and know my heart. Test me and know my thoughts. And see if there's any wicked way in me. And lead me in the way everlasting. I don't look ahead. I follow a path. I'm seeking to follow you, God, but I have taken the wrong turns. I have taken dives. I have condemned those around me. I have condemned those different than me. I've can want, create, counted it enemies, those that don't love you like I do. Oh God, search me again. And if there's something that's not supposed to be there, you lead me to eternal ways. Or the words we're studying today, take away the temporary, oh God, and put my eyes and mind on that which will last forever. Forever. So we come to a purpose. Our purpose. Sharing God's love on this corner, from this corner, to every corner. I was challenged and reminded that what I ought to do is before anybody can leave the sanctuary, they shake the minister's hand, they ought to be able to quote that to every person, every minister at the exit. We need to, we need to be able to say, sharing God's love, on this corner, from this corner, to every corner. Paul's talking to the church at Corinth. It's like a church I was reminded of that at 1201, 1201, Ben Strickland, you'd love being a member at that church. 1201, it, the party's over. 1201, the minister always says, it's time to get off the bus. It's time to get off the bus. It's 1201. We've gathered, we've prepared, we've trained, we've worshipped, we've leaned on one another, and now it's time to get off the bus. It's time to go to work. And so Paul tells the church at Corinth, let your light shine out of darkness. Get off the bus. Get off the bus and go to work. Like the psalmist early on at the church at Corinth had a heart problem. The church at Corinth had a heart problem. A love problem, a self-centered problem, a all appearance to them. It was all they could think of. It looks to me like, from their vantage point, as they looked out and were told to get on the bus, they said, I'm not so sure I want to get off the bus. They're looking out, and it, all appearances are, the world's winning. The world's winning. Every appearance is the world is winning. And Paul says, don't lose heart. Don't lose heart. Let light shine out of the darkness. Billy Graham always did a sound check before his big crusade service. And, you know, when we do that sometimes, Christy and Johnny and Lori, whoever's up there, and we'll do a sound check before the service. And you either say one, two, three, four, or A, B, C, D, or the weather outside is delightful, or, or something like that. And it's said of Billy Graham that every sound check that he evolved into doing was for God so loved the world, that he gave his only begotten Son, that whosoever believeth in him would not perish, but have everlasting life. So they'd say, test the mic. Dr. Graham, he'd go, for God so loved the world, that he gave his only begotten Son. 
Whosoever believeth in him would not perish, but have everlasting life. And they asked him, why is that what you say on your sound check? And he said, well, just in case, just in case, almost needed another sound check, just in case, I don't get to be here tonight, or the service is canceled, or it rains, something happens, or something happens to me, at least the cameraman and the sound engineer heard it. At least the cameraman and the sound engineer heard it. Paul says, don't lose heart. Don't lose heart. Let your light shine out in darkness, verse 6. Let your light shine out of darkness. 2 Corinthians 4, verse 6. So often in the dark, the voices we hear are from the darkness. They're from the darkness. They're the reminders of everything you need to be afraid of. Every voice that says, man, you're in the dark, and, 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 and that dark likes you, and it wants you to stay here, or nobody's watching, or nobody can see, and remain in the darkness. And the voices and the chatter gets louder and louder and louder. And there are a lot of times I can't shake it. I can't get that chatter to stop. I can't get those voices when it's dark, and I'm sitting still, and I can't get them to stop. I keep hearing them over and over again. And so Paul's saying that in the darkness, in those voices you hear, in the dark, let your light shine. Let your light shine. Choose in the light, in the day, what voices you're going to listen to. Isn't that it? Isn't that right? I mean, if we, if we had a graduate sermon, we wanted to give, if we wanted to give every person that graduated from high school, we're talking to Luke today, but we, we want to talk to every graduate or every person that moved from, from one something to another. We would say it's about what voices you choose to listen to. Are you moving to the next thing based on a voice you shouldn't be listening to? Are you moving to the next thing because of the voice of light? Are you going toward the light? Are you sharing light? Or are you remaining in the darkness? For our sake, for our sake, and for the sake of others, for our sake and for the sake of others, we choose what to see and what to listen to. Paul says, consider putting your eyes on the face of Jesus that can give our broken hearts the light of the knowledge of the glory of God. Don't lose heart, Paul says. Focus your eyes on the face of Jesus that can give our broken hearts the light of the knowledge of the glory of God. Do you want to glorify you want others to see Jesus? I'm not sure Robin sees Jesus enough when she hears Roy pray. Because I'm not sure she hears Roy pray out loud often enough. She knows I pray. And, and somewhat with the wringing of hands and unceasing, but but, but out loud for the world to see Jesus. Not to look at me, I'm praying on the corner and woohoo. But to see Jesus. To see Jesus. So where is this light that, that can heal a broken heart? Verse 7 says, the treasure is in clay jars. The treasure is in clay jars. Luke, one of the things I remember about our youth Sunday a few years ago is you did some artwork right over here. Well, I think William was speaking, or youth was speaking and sharing a story. And you did art where you were creating something that we could see. It was an artist. Paul is telling those folks at the Church of Corinth that some artwork, <laughs> he's using that as an example, you know, jar clays hold the treasure, hold the treasure. But what are the things that we know about clay jars? They can break, right? They can break. They can break. There's some cultures... Uh, and I think mostly Eastern, that, that fill up the cracks with gold, and it really looks good and shiny to keep it together. But it's about what we can see, right? That's about the temporary, not the eternal. So Paul's saying these clay jars contain the treasure. The clay jars are not the treasure. And so they're, they're contained 
we know they can break, that they're broken, that they're made by an artist. They're made by a creator. And that the light we are asked to shine from earthly vessels, made vessels, our, our bodies, are a light that is to shine forever. Imperfect, yes, but loved and known. Loved and known is the treasure. Don't lose heart, Paul said. The power comes from God, not from us. The power comes from God, not from us. Paul's description of jar clays is the same as the body the psalmist learned was created, loved, and known by God. When searched and looked at, verse 8 and 9 in chapter 4 of 2 Corinthians, Paul reminds us of our, our bodies, who we are, our lives, our souls that contain the treasure. Afflicted but not crushed, perplexed but not driven to despair, persecuted but not forsaken, struck down but not destroyed. And we may be sitting in the choir loft or in the sanctuary right now and we feel crushed, despair, forsaken, destroyed, down. We're all about that jar. We're all about that jar. Oh, I pray you can hear the words. Again, dying, yes, verse 12. Dying, yes, but life is in us. Life is in us. Don't lose heart. What are you focused on? The jars or the treasure they contain? Don't lose heart. Keep your eyes on the treasure. Luke's been a treasure to many. I, I heard from two women in his life yesterday, Mildred Shipes and Amelia King. And that's about as age-wise, about as far apart as you can get. And they both liked them some Luke. They liked them some Luke. And they wanted to know, and whenever and when they and, and they both had the same questions, Luke, on uh, around here. If they didn't see, they say, Where's Luke? Because they loved you, and they looked at you, and cared about you. My experiences, you know, are with Passport and Carowinds and Vacation Bible School. When you do a, a backyard Bible club in a trailer park, um, they did it a couple years. One time I got to go, and then the, the next year I think the youth group went. But when Luke does a backyard Bible club in a trailer park, he is a pied piper. He is a pied piper. He didn't stay in the yard. He was all over that neighborhood. Because he knew it, and they knew him. And he wanted to tell them why he was there. It's interesting to me that he wants to be a welder. Um, I got to thinking, you know, that sure would have been helpful at some of the passport camps, because then you could have welded the door shut, and y'all couldn't have got out. That would have, been a, that would have been a good move in the middle of the night. But anyway... Um, Our prayer for one another today in the celebration of, a, of graduates and graduating and in hearing the words not to lose heart are the challenge to focus on the eternal. I was with a good friend who's dying of cancer and I was asking him what that was, what that was doing. He'd been given five years to live and January will be five years. And he told me, he said, dying is teaching me not to care about what I used to think was so important. And I thought, you know, is that, is, that what, is that what you share with an 18-year-old and 50-year-old and 60-year-old and 4-year-old and 30-year-old and 90-year-old? I think it is. I think it is. I mean, we go through seasons when things are, are really important, and they should be. So don't, I'm not... And eh, just, just, just what's important. But that's an incredible lesson to be reminded of in this study of Corinth and, th and their heart problem and their challenge to be bold and courageous by a holy God that loved them and made them and knows them and searches them was, 
I'm getting layers in this journey as I'm continuing to go toward the promised land. His layers are being taken off, and I'm learning of all the stuff that I used to think was so important. And it's not. Paul says, don't lose heart. Place your eyes on the eternal. For Romans 8 says, what I stand on, what I believe in, there is no condemnation in Christ, and there is nothing that can separate us from the love of God. Amen. And amen. Let's pray together. God, we prepare to sing to you. We pray to, to begin to sing and to, to leave this place of worship and get off the bus. And so speak to us, and your spirit move us and encourage us to focus on that which is important. Speak to us so that we can speak. Lead us to not be so consumed with being seen that we can see. May that be so. Jesus' name I pray. Amen. And amen. Let's stand and sing together. M568. Come back up here for just a minute. Luke Patrick Mason, you're not in trouble. Can you hear me? Is this thing on? I can't tell. Okay, good. Um, everybody else has been sharing something I wanted to play. I remember when I was in youth at Wilkesboro Baptist, I had this puppet leader named Robin Dobbins. And she got me in those years when I actually believed I was cool. It was like five minutes, I believe that. She got, she got us to enthusiastically do puppets. We dragged puppet stages into New Orleans, Ocean City, Maryland, Brooklyn, New York, and we hauled that PVC and those drapes around, and we, my, our favorite song, do you remember what it was, Rob? Our favorite one to do was Let Your Little Light Shine. And it was this goofy pop rock version of that song, and it was, the, I mean, it was just ridiculous. But we loved it. it I mean, and we fought to be the the lead singer. And I remember when Greg Little graduated two years ahead of me, that meant that the next year I got to do the lead version of Let Your Little Light Shine. And I was cool. One, one, yeah, one man's opinion. No. It didn't last long. And I could, if, if there was a puppet stage right now and a puppet, sock puppet, million dollar puppet, I could do that song right now. I could. I mastered it. You believe me? You believe me? It's the truth. It's the truth. It's the truth. I'm, I'm serious. I was serious about those puppets. You've seen me? Oh, yeah, you've seen me. I'm good. I'm really good. What I've learned since then is I'm not that cool. <laughs> I've learned that I was wrong then. I didn't think that I had to get shiny enough. I didn't have to get bright enough. I didn't have to get smart enough. I didn't have to get enough. I learned that I had to let Christ shine through my imperfections. 
I had to be humble enough to say I'm not bright enough to change the world. I had to realize that my job was to get out of the way so that that clay pot that Roy talked to us about doesn't get in the way of the light of Christ. And I am very, very grateful that I have learned that lesson because I won't get shiny enough. And neither will you. And I hope that truth will become as freeing to you as it has to me. So, in benediction, before you come, and if you didn't get a chance yet to give this young man your congratulations, I hope you'll take time. You have to stay up here. Sorry. I hope you'll take a minute to do that. But on your way out, let your little light shine. Amen? Amen.